what we're going to be looking at is imagine that you are, are, are you're, you're looking at a bramble, a dense tangle of material, all of these different overlapping shapes. And you want to be able to draw them in your sketchbook without going nuts. So this could be in, say, a nest, and there are all these little fibers going back and forth. Um, it could be that you've got a bird, and then there's the blackberry bush and brambles behind it. But um, being able to get a sense of depth and space and tangle um, is, is, is and, and overlapping shapes is really, really fun. Um, let me just sort of show you the, 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 the problem that I kind of um, initially get into when I, I try to do something. Maybe you've, you've faced the, the same problem. I'm going to jump over here to the document camera. Hello, document camera. And go for document camera audio so that I can to be heard here. Um, and we're good to go. All right, so um, here, here we go. Here's, here's sort of the, the challenge. Let's say I've, I've got a nest in front of me and I am uh, going to, to, to draw that. So I'm first going to lightly block this out. Let's say I have a, a nest that, oh, I should go a little bit darker on this. There we are. You can see that. All right, and focus. All right, so here is my nest. And I'm initially just going to make this a little bowl. Um, and the bowl is going to have a little bit of thickness to it. So I'm just sort of blocking in the structure that I see. But now I want this to be covered with a, a, a tangle of, of material. And so I draw in my, my first grass blade, and then I put in my next grass blade, and I put in my next grass blade. And you might kind of find yourself, you've ever been in one of these situations where you start kind of doing this all over the surface of the thing, and you end up with something that looks like you just kind of crossed. You know, the, the problem is I have, let's say I've got this grass blade here. Everything is crossing over each other, and there's no clear overlap. Nothing is in front, nothing is behind. And so, oh, how sad. I mean, look at, look at this. So here's, here's, here's the problem. I mean, these guys are not overlapping. I'm getting this kind of tic-tac-toe board effect. That is not overlapping grass blades. That's the tic-tac-toe board. So I don't want that. I don't want that. So how am I going to fight against this? Well, I'm gonna start here by just giving myself um, a little bit of tone background. Um, I've got right here a smudger. This is a piece of paper, and it's all kind of uh, sort of wadded up, rolled up piece of paper. And what I'm gonna initially do is smudge in these grass blades. Right. And there it is, sort of a, a smooth a smooth wad of, of, of grass blades. Now I want to introduce you to my secret weapon. This is the Tombow Mono Zero. And what it is, is a very thin eraser. Um, and so if you, you look here, the tip of it is just like a pen, but it's got an eraser in it. 
These are, there are other versions of this that also work just great. So it doesn't have to be this specific brand, but essentially what I've got here is a fine eraser. And I can come along any of these strands and erase them in. And because I've got this background that is dark, these pale lines are showing up. And so initially I am, and I can, I can follow lines that I've already put in, or I can just sort of put in other ones. So like there's one that's going to come here. It's going to go, whoa, there we go. And then this one's going to curl around there. And maybe a few more on the edges. All right. So I put in a few strands there. And I think I want... Now, if I were looking at a real nest, you would find that the, the bird is going to weave these through here with... with Often there, there will be a specific direction to them, like in a certain area, you find a number of things kind of going in the same direction. The bird perches here and it weaves them through in this direction. But um, because I don't have that in front of me right now, I'm just kind of putting, there's a jumble here. Now, what I do is I am going to pick a few of these to be the ones that are in front. So let me zoom here a little bit more. All right, so there is, there's my bowl. All right. And now um, I can't say like this one here, I want to be in front there. I can draw along its edge. This one here, I can draw lightly along its edge. And when I'm drawing along the edges of these, if I draw, let's say there's a grass blade and I draw a line along this side and a line along this side, it's going to look really mechanical. But if on the other hand, I draw a line along this side and that line comes and goes, all right, you see how that line has variation in it? And the other one, all right, I get a more natural, interesting line if some places my line kind of has breaks, some places it's lighter. So this is a really great place to, for me to just intentionally put in so a little bit of variation in my lines. So as I'm kind of playing with these, some places I want, all right, this one is gonna come right here. Some places my line So just working some of the edges of these. And I think I just want a few more little lines to work with. And by the way, if I want something to be brighter with this Tombow, I just wipe it a few more times and that brightens that line. But now the really cool part where this really kind of starts to pop in is when I take my pencil and I go back into this, into some of the dark areas, and I'm going to just add a little bit of punch in some of those little shadow areas. And I'm working around working around those lines that I have popped in with my eraser. gives it a lot more depth. So and with this, I want to, in some places, I'm really gonna punch my darks in. Let me just zoom down on that part there. Uh, the film is getting a little bit grainy in here, but you can see, you can see that I am 
that by having some of these places really kind of pushed back there into the dark, this whole thing starts to feel like this tangle of vegetation. And what that came from, again, is first the smudger, actually getting some graphite on there. And the graphite I'm using, this is 2B lead that's in my mechanical pencil. So I put down just some lead with 2B and then I smudged it and then I erased it with the fine point eraser. And then came back in and crisped up some of the edges with with my pen. And also some places I'm really just gonna, I'm gonna punch in, punch in some of those darks. I really want there to be some, with respect to my great teacher and Coddle, some divots of darkness. Um, divots of darkness, I'm gonna drop in some divots of darkness right back there, there's another divot. Little divots of darkness and that whole thing just becomes a lot more dynamic, a lot more, it does not, I mean, that was, you get this kind of organic whoom, thing, but that came about just, just by the interactions of these tools, All right? So I'm now gonna back back out, because let's say perhaps that you are not a graphite person, right? <clears throat> let's say there's another media, oh, actually, let, before I, I do this, let's, let me just kind of go on with one other thing that's really kind of fun. So this, by the way, soft pencil, the danger of soft pencil is that it likes to smudge, right? So, and the more that this rolls around in your journal, the more it's going to smudge. And that's, that's, that's troubling. So if you have soft pencil that is getting all super smudgy in your journal, you can come by with erasers and kind of try to clean that up. Um, or you can also hit it with fixative that prevents it from doing as much smudging. By the way, your smudging is much worse if you are um, in a spiral bound notebook. These are the formula for smudge. These guys like to smudge your drawings because each page can do this, right? It will wiggle around independently of the other pages. And those pages then rub against each other and they turn everything to smudges. But another way that is useful if you're doing stuff with graphite in the field of, of solving the smudge problem is if you give your page just a light wash of watercolor. Right. And then it's brown. All right, now I've got a brown basket. Put a little bit of other color variation in there. All right. So those colors now come through. The value is all done by the um, graphite pencil that was underneath it. So I now have this watercolor picture with value of all these little strands and things. And I'll be coming back and kind of tweaking this just a little bit more. Um, in a moment. Um, there's a few other tools that are in your arsenal if you're trying to get something to look complex and overlapping if um, <clears> these <throat> sort of tangles if you're using watercolor. So let's take a look at a couple of strategies that are specific to watercolor. So back here in the back part of my, my basket, um, I am going to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, do some, some interesting things back here. The first is I'm going to put in a light coat of paint, put in a light coat of paint back there that will be sort of a, a base highlight color. I'm gonna test my color off on the side here. That is a little bit too dark. I'm gonna want, uh, that will do. All right, so I want to have some kind of background color back here. So I'm just putting in some, 
putting in some paint split spot 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 um, this I'm intentionally kind of roughing it up and kind of going different directions with my brush just so in case an edge shows up the edge won't look like that right if an edge shows up there it's going to be you know just doing something like that a little bit more which will look a little bit more organic All right now I'm going to let this material dry completely um, and what I do when I'm in my studio is I have a little hair dryer. Unfortunately, all the way over on this side of the room, I'm going to hit my watercolor with my hair dryer. If you're out in the field, I just take my journal and I tilt it at an angle that uh, points it towards the sun. So here we go. That's good and dry. I'm not really using any um, fancy paper. Um, fancy paper here. Um, this is just it is light sketchbook paper. There we go. And actually, I'm going to twist us around here. Get my no. Here we go. Ah, here we are. So we're not looking at upside down nest. <coughs> here we are. So here's, here's my nest. I put some watercolor in back here. Now, let me show you a couple of other strategies. Remember how I put tone in before? Um, what I can also do is, um, here's the low tech method. This is a white crayon. And with the white crayon, I can come in here and with the edge of it, I'm going to draw in some lines here. And it's hard for me to tell exactly where I'm drawing these lines. But I am, often if I will take my head and tilt it at an angle, I'll be able to see kind of a strange little, uh, you can't, doesn't really show up in here, but there's a slight difference in the gloss that I get. So I've got a few crayon lines over this area. Then if I take a darker color, all right, test it before it hits my paper, and I paint that over here, See, I get those light lines shining through. That crayon acts as a resist. That crayon is, so a resist is something that makes your, um, your, uh, your, the watercolor not stick to the paper. Wax and water don't, don't mix very well. I can even darken it a little bit here. You notice it's covering up some of those lines a little bit. In those places, there's a layer of wax. There's now some paint on top of it. But that paint is not sticking to the paper. Um, so I can just come along well, just like this and stroke my pencil in there and get those, some of those lines back. Yeah, there they are. They're hiding. They're hiding underneath a little bit of paint. So I get some of my lines back. So it gives me some bright lines. And so I'll, I'll, I'll keep those. Um, and now I'm going to just brush around here. And what I'm doing is I'm making little kind of edge of, I'm making little kind of lines, not covering this completely. I'm just sort of drawing in a little thing here in those those other lines that I put in, they pop up, they show through. I put a bunch of them around the edge. Then I'm going to take the sharp tip of my brush and do the same thing where I'm going to kind of come in 
Uh, it's a little bit too intense. Um, I'm going to paint in some of these areas in and around So again, these are the official and caudal divots of darkness that I'm kind of putting in there. And so you get some darker pieces, some lighter pieces. And then it will help if some of these also stick out the side so that you know you can have some things that are that makes all of those those pieces but once there's um once there is, uh, the wax is down, the wax is there and it doesn't, it, it, it's going to be there for the long term. I'm going to just get my hair dryer and dry this area in here for one more moment. There's the upside down me. All right, this, this now, um, here we go. Um, so I've dried this area in here. So if I want to, I can come also into this place on the inside and give myself just a few little dark accents inside here. Jack, there's a question about whether the crayon needs to be white, and could you use the nest color? Oh, that's an interesting color. Question, uh, sorry, interesting question. I don't know. I've never tried other ones. I imagine you could. Um, I just use a white one because that way I can have a sketching kit that is um, just a, a, doesn't have as many things in it as, you know, I, it keeps my sketching kit lighter. I'm going to put a little bit of blue wash down in this corner of the nest. Just to, there we go. So, um, but I want to show you another technique that you can use. And uh, this is more of a, a gear thing, but you know, so trick number one, we have the, the fine eraser, right? Trick number two, we're using our crayon to leave us some of those little pale areas. Trick number three, um, it's another kind of gear thing. This is, what is this? This is uh, PBO, PBO masking fluid in a pen. And so I've got um, this, so if, if I'm just gonna draw some lines off here on the side. I, I first, I, what I wanna do is just sort of kind of bounce it back and forth, get it flowing a little bit. Um, and do I shake it, shake it, shake it. I wanna get it flowing, pressing, flowing. Any time now that you want to flow would be just great. Uh, now it's going. All right, so you see that little kind of, you can see a faint blue line there. Uh, no, you can't, well, barely you can. Um, I can see a faint blue line. Um, and that then allows me to kind of come over here and I am going to, with this blue thing, I'm going to 
start just to draw the direction of the fibers that I want to show. Oops, we're off screen. So this masking fluid has a slight, a slight tint to it. It's essentially rubber cement um, or masking fluid, but because it is, um, because it is blue, I can see where I'm, I'm, I'm putting it. And so I'm just getting a few little lines, dashes, pieces of this thing going. And you see that this actually is going to give me a lot more control over what I'm doing than the crayon. Once the crayon is there, the crayon, it's there, right? And it's not going anywhere. It's also harder to see where I've put my crayon. You can barely see um, the marks from, from this. Now, once it's dry, I can get some paint and Here I am, I'm painting into this area on the interior. <laughs> and I'm getting a sort of rough texture with my brush. There we go. <clears throat> Now I'm going to let, actually a few places, I think I want to punch this in even darker. And it kind of looks blotchy. You're not seeing fibers like you were over here. But wait for it, wait for it. As I'm going to let this dry. The thing that's cool about this stuff is that uh, once it's dry, you can you can come along and rub it off and when I rub it off, I'm going back to white paper that is underneath there. Um, so I'm letting this business over here dry. I'm not going to hit this with my, um, I'm not going to hit this with my hair dryer because I don't want this rubber cement stuff to kind of bake into my paper. This got a little bit baked, and so you see that some of this rubber cement here is having a hard time. It's, it's wanting to, it's, it's not wanting to come up. So I don't want to have that same problem over here. Um, so I'm just letting this dry, and it seems reasonably dry. And I'm going to now rub this with my finger. Oh. And Oh, I did it while my paper is still wet. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so I did it while my paper is still wet, and what I've done is I've just ripped up all my texture of my paper. Oh dear. I'm going to just try this demonstration in a different part of my page because that tanked. Um, the, uh, but I'm going to let see if I can let that dry a little bit more and see if I can do that again. Um, what I want to be able to do is, and it's a little bit drier up there. Yeah, see, I just waited. <laughs> this is actually, this is kind of cool because you get to see um, where I waited long enough and where I was too, too early. And sometimes seeing something go wrong, you can kind of learn through somebody other, else's mistakes. So you see how up in this part, I've got these nice clean lines. And down here, it's all chowder, right? Here, I was so anxious and excited 
to show you how this looked that I started rubbing this part off with my finger while the paper was still a little bit damp. And instead of just rubbing off the rubber cement as I did up above, what I've ended up doing is just tearing up the surface texture of my paper. Right? Once it's all dry, you can rub this stuff off. If you do it too early, you get some of these problems. But I can still kind of work with this. The neat thing about this versus over here is that now, um, because I've rubbed the rubber cement off, I can actually paint over these things. I couldn't actually paint over this stuff because I've got the wax on top of it. But over here, um, you can paint on it again. And, oh, could I borrow that? One more moment. I'm going to put... just a little line of this blue here, um, a couple back into it. There you go, here you go, honey. Um, right. I can paint over this business and those um, and it'll just be working like regular paper. So I can come along here and in the edges of some of these kind of add more. Just remember when I was kind of punching in those divots of darkness down here, I now have these lines that are helping me kind of see where my and it's just regular paper now. Some divots of darkness, but I can also, unlike I was uh, again with with the the wax here, it was just there. If I want to, what I can do is I can take some darker paint, and I can make a line over this here, and it's now going across those things that were white lines. I can make another line here to go across some of those. So I can either honor the little white spaces that I had created with those or obliterate them as I wish. So any place where it just kind of looks too chowdery, um, I can just paint over that. Now, right now, so I'm putting in some more of my divots of darkness. So Ann Caudle is one of the, uh, that's where I get the sort of divots of darkness thing from. She was uh, one of the instructors in the science illustration at Cal State Monterey Bay when uh, used to be at UC Santa Cruz. And um, she would always uh, kind of, it was one of her terms and spent some time training with her and her voice is still in my head today. Um, just add just a little divot of darkness right in there. The other thing she said, she was like, I'm just getting here and crisp up those edges right in there, right in there. And that voice is still in the back of my head. Very kind of useful ideas, sort of those little value things. So yeah, that's, that's starting to kind of come together. But also notice that it looks a little bit too bright, like there's some spaghetti that's just brightly laying on the inside here. Um, because this side of this thing, um, because this side of this thing is, um, is done with the, uh, what am I trying to say? With, with the, uh, <clears throat> what, 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 isn't it interesting how your brain blanks on a word? The, the, the masking fluid. The masking fluid. What I'll be able to do is to, um, to come in here and just put a little bit more tone into this area and kind of push it, push it back. So in just a moment, I'm going to let this dry a little bit more. I'm using approach to watercolor where I put something down, let it dry, put something down, let it dry, put something down, let it dry. 
Um, but in just a moment, I'm gonna push all of this back just a little bit so it feels like some distant far side of the nest instead of really kind of bright this side of the nest. I'm gonna add, take some of these little lines on the edge here and just sort of pull them up. And check out Mary Jo, uh, Mary Jo Coke, um, and, or, or Coach, um, and, and her books, um, wonderful, wonderful drawings of nests. She's using gouache paint where she can actually uh, just be able to, to draw over the edge of something. This should be dry enough for me now. Here we go. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of blue gray. Um, so there's some purple, there's some bluish purpley gray. All right, yep. And I'm just going to put that right down here in this corner of the nest. So yeah, so it's pushing all of those um, those 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 elements back um, because it's not see this this stays bright no matter what I do right but here I'm able to get back in and retint on top um, and and tint on top of it because I am I'm working. There are a few real divots of darkness right along. Oh, that's a little bit too dark. Soak that, some of that up with my pencil tip. There you go. Now I'm going to let that dry. So it, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of that, just that kind of tangled web we weave going on in that part of the nest. So we've seen three different approaches to doing that. I'm going to show you one additional approach. Carol, oh, maybe are your wash kit. Oh. Oh, great. great. Um, well, actually, I think that's a that's some watercolor. Let me see if I've got it washed it right. All right. So gouache paint is an opaque white paint, um, and I. On my palette, I always carry a little bit of emergency gouache with me. So this is some of my gouache right here. This is white gouache and, oh, thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn's just found my gouache kit for me. I carry also often a little um, box of only light value gouache. And um, I can use these opaque paints to add more dimension on top of, of things that I've already put down. So if, for instance, I want to have a light brown mark here, I can, with the gouache, come along and paint on top of some of these, pulling those out even more. So what it does is gives you the ability to take some elements with a fine brush and pull those fibers forward. One warning about this though, is you will find that when you first put it down, it looks really, really bold. But then, like I'm gonna put down a stroke and at first it'll be bright white, and then watch, in a few seconds, it will not be as, as bold. So if I have a mark right here, right? At first it really stands out, and now it's less, and now it's less. Remember, when it first came down, it was this white, right? But, and you'll see that those 
as they as it dries, it darkens a little bit. So that's a confusing thing about the way that gouache works. It's not sort of what you see is what you get. Um, so you just have to be aware that it is going to be, uh, they'll be messing with you a little bit like that. Um, but that's another way of getting, you know, these sort of texture. So if I want over the top of this, if I want there to be you know, just a little hint of, you know, what, what if we put in here some little um, horse hairs or little fine roots in this, I, I, I can come and put in some of those marks with this brush. And so that's a very useful kind of at the end, just to add a little bit more detail. I wouldn't want to do it towards the start of a drawing because as I put in other values and things, this will, stuff will just smudge around. Maybe I want to add into this dark here, uh, just a little bit of light. All of these approaches allow me to kind of get this tangled, tangled um, nest effect. This is still damp. I, I put in some uh, another layer of um, of this masking fluid into here. Remember, there's a couple of stripes there. I'm really excited to get in there and, and rub those off, but the paper is still damp. I'm not going to make that mistake twice and pull it off yet. Um, but uh, I'm very excited about doing that. So you see, all these techniques allow us to get these, these, these dark spots, these light fibers to things that will give your nest a sense of depth and you can use them on their own or you can use them together and it will build up a, a lot of texture. Jack, um, can, there's a couple of questions here. One is about um, using the white gel pen in the same way and the other is about your gouache. What, where you get your gouache? Oh, good questions. Um, so I uh, I'm actually preparing to to do a, a, some wor workshops all about messing with gouache, and so I'm trying to figure out what are the some of the the what are the best brands to use. Well, let me show you what I don't like about gouache, and I'm trying to get all of these things resolved before the workshop. Some types of gouache will fracture into all these little pieces. Like you see how this, this light green here, it's got all these little cracks all over it. When you open it up, they'll just get chunks flying all over your kit. And that bothers me, right? I don't want that effect. Um, others seem to be holding together nicely. I'm trying to solve those. So which ones can I um, kind of get that with? Once I kind of get that bug worked out, I'm going to have a workshop where I'm going to have a suggestion of gouache brands um, for specific colors that will not do too much cracking. Um, see, some of them do a little bit of cracking, some do a lot of cracking, and this, this bad boy just sort of fractured into so many pieces that every time that this case will shake, they'll just dust themselves all around inside of here. That I don't like. Um, so I haven't resolved those yet, so I don't have yet my list of recommendations, and I don't want to do that prematurely, but I will be doing that, and I will be um, then having a full workshop on on how to oops um, how to how to play with gouache. Um, was there another question? Yes, about the gel pen. Oh, the gel pen. Thank you for asking. Um, why didn't I include the gel pen in this? Because I forgot. I love me some gel pens, and the gel pen is also a great tool in your kit. So whoever said, what about the gel pen? I absolutely agree. What about the gel pen? Let's include it in this workshop because for doing exactly this, it is a really useful uh, tool. So this is a pen that has um, ink inside of it that is opaque. And when I draw with that, I get white light lines on top of whatever it is that I'm looking at. 
So I can come across some of these. Now, if it's all, they're also going to be a fairly uniform width, all right? So I want to intentionally have my, um, some places just do it as dots, some places as a line. But if I do a whole bunch of drawing in here, it will start to look like, like, oh, you've got a gel pen that is that width. So some, some places kind of get it, sort of tap it out as little dots. Other places, um, you can double it up to make a thicker line. Um, that way it looks a little bit less, less mechanical. Um, also, if you put a gel pen line down and you feel that it is too harsh, what you can do is immediately just tap it with your finger and you see some of that ink comes up on my finger and that line gets a, a little bit lighter. So if you get something and it feels a little bit too gel pen harsh or if you want a line that will fade out, I tap the tip of it and then that line fades up. But you do that right when you put it down, the line is coming along, tap the end of it. Also, sometimes if you draw, you'll find that at the, where it ends, there's see that little white dot at the end? I don't want that. I tap it with my finger and then it comes up. So the gel pens are great. I use them for highlights and for this sort of a thing would be a, a, a terrific addition to the kit. Um, it's so much fun to use that there will be a tendency to overdo it. So just be aware on the gel pen to stop before you think you're done because it is, you, you'll just want to go crazy and all of a sudden it'll look like, oh, you took a gel pen and just drew a whole bunch of little lines right on top of that. A little bit, it'll be subtle. Too much, it will be overkill and, um, and you'll be thinking to yourself, I wish I stopped that a little bit earlier. Now let's see if I can get rub some of this off. So I took that off. Now those feel too bright for me, but again, it is now just regular paper. So I can go back in and I can paint those. I can tone them down. That's the cool thing about using masking fluid, is that you can, you can push and pull with it. Crayon, you can't. Once the crayon is there, it's there. And those are a handful of techniques. So we've actually you've got a bunch of stuff in your, your, your quiver. We took a look at using the um, thin eraser and a smudging tool. And again, that's with soft pencil. Then we took a look at using watercolor with a crayon. And we took a look at watercolor with masking fluid. And lastly, we have the gel pen in, as part of our toolkit. All of these strategies, all of these strategies will help you get that, that dense effect. Um, and I think you'll find that that's going to help you be able to get those textures that you want in the nest.